Hello, and welcome to a lecture on thinking and language for psychology with learning the social sciences. So today we're going to be focusing on cognition. What is cognition? It's the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. Cognitive psychology is simply the study of human information processing. What in the world is your brain doing when thinking? Cognition can include reasoning, judgment, and assembling new information into knowledge. Your cognitive ability or our cognitive ability separates us from other species as we can think, know, and remember like no other. So we're going to be going through a whole bunch of different terms. The first one is going to be concept. Concept is a mental grouping based on shared similarity. A concept can be represented by thinking how you organize your bedroom and group items together like shirts all in one pla place, pants all in one place, your area maybe that you just kind of keep putting empty water or soda bottles, something like that. Objects, events, and people are grouped together in our mind. We automatically do that. So when I ask you to visualize a car, you have a generalized image that appears in your mind. Now, I may have skewed it because I have an old timer car right there uh, from 1923, but usually you're going to be picking something modern or maybe a car that you or your family owns. It could be something like that. Um, but we do kind of have our stereotypical image in our mind. We're usually not going to be taking a 1923 Model T, something like that. But, you know, we could. Either way, a modern car and an old car is still a car. They still drove. So there we go. Concept for you. Now we have the prototype. A prototype is the best example when incorporating the major features of a concept. So a new car is better suited to our prototype of a car than a 1923 Model T, continuing on with that example. They're both cars. Now we also have concept hierarchies, our mental organization system. So we can go with the overarching uh, topic of food, and then we can break it down into bread and bread types. Then we can go to white bread. Then from white bread, we go into French bread, and then all the way down to a baguette. So we can go and do that, our concept hierarchies, and we can do that with numerous different topics. Now problem solving. Problem solving refers to the thinking we do in order to answer a complex question or to figure out how to resolve an unfavorable situation. It helps us reach a goal by carefully thinking and behaving in a specific way. So while we're problem solving, obviously we're going to have to make a decision. And so we have different ways and tactics that we can try to resolve the problem. So we have trial and error. That involves trying various possible solutions. And if that fails, hey, we can try another option. It's also known as the mechanical solution. So if you have ever watched the movie Hidden Figures, and if you haven't, you should definitely do it, but you can see how many attempts it took to figure out how to send someone in to orbit in space and the different areas. Of course, you have to get the actual physical rocket and spacecraft and all of that stuff uh, ready to go into space. And then you have to sit there and figure out all of the math to get them there and get them back. And you can see all the different attempts, daily attempts, hourly attempts to try to figure it out through trial and error. So trial and error may never find the right solution. There is a person from the scientific revolution, Tycho Brahe. He spent his entire life trying to prove geocentric theory, the Earth-centered universe. And he dedicated all of his money, all of his time and everything. He built an observatory out on an island that he purchased. And yes, he went to prove geocentric theory, but he could never do it. Why? Because he was wrong. His assistant, though, Kepler, is going to help prove heliocentric theory by figuring out ellipses. But, you know, that's just a whole nother area and subject area. 
problem solving. So we have another area which we can use to solve a problem, an algorithm. An algorithm is a specific step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem, methodically leading to a specific solution. If there is a right answer, it will be found. So it's like the Rubik's Cube. Yes, it might take some people under a minute to actually figure it out, and you can go on YouTube and watch those amazing people do that. It might take other people an entire lifetime to figure it out without directions, but there is an actual solution to it. And there are solutions to your everyday ordinary problems. Can I go to the movies? Well, right now, no. Um, but um, if you're thinking about it in the general sense of things, do you have any homework? Yes, if you have homework, can you get it done on time? If it's no, then no, you can't go to the movies. But if it's yes, now what's your next problem or hurdle that you have to overcome? Do you have money? Well, if it's yes, go ahead and call a friend, you know. Um, but if it's no, no, or no in any of these, or for any of these questions, then the answer is going to be no. You can't go to the movies. You have to think reasonably here. So what process do you use if, say, you forget a locker combination or anything else, a pin to get into your ATM? What is the process that you would have? There is a solution to figuring out your pin. There is a solution to figuring out your locker combination. It might just be a long, painful pro process if you really have to just type out numbers. But, you know, if it's a bank card, call your bank. If it's a locker in a school, ask the appropriate people to help you. So heuristics, um, this is a rule of thumb problem solving strategy that makes a solution more likely and efficient, but does not guarantee an actual solution. So you've probably done it because students use the saying, especially in elementary when you're learning this, use I before E except after C. Going to a specific furniture store to get a new mattress for a specific brand that you want. You know where to go. Going back to the car analogy, if you know you want to buy a specific brand of car, you are going to go that, to that specific brand car dealership. So using control F to find a word or section on a website so you do not have to read the entire thing. You are going to fast forward through it and find the solution as fast as you can. You're going to do a shortcut. So that that's basically summarizes all of that. So insight uh, also relates to this. It refers to a sudden realization, a leap forward in thinking that leads us to a solution. It is that aha that we can have for that realization. We've got it. The light bulb switches on. Or if you're listening, you know, to a comedy show, it's finally when you start to laugh because you get the punchline, you see where it has gone. Now, insight um, involves three abilities. We have selective encoding. Selecting information that is relevant to a problem while ignoring all distractions. We then have selective combination. Connecting seemingly unrelatable bits of useful information. And then we have selective comparison. Comparing new problems with old information or with problems already solved. So we have all of them underneath this category of insight. Now, if we're going to be going and looking again at trial and error, algorithms, and heuristics, so we can go through and use a grocery store example. Trial and error, you have to find green olives, something that's not like milk where you just know where to go and get it. So you enter the grocery store and you just kind of wander aimlessly hoping to find the green olives. That's trial and error. If you have an algorithm when you go in there, you create a specific path that you will follow where you go aisle by aisle until you find it. However, you can also use the other method with heuristics and you can check the aisles with food related items and follow the path that way. You're probably not going to find green olives in the same aisle as toilet paper. Probably not going to be shelved that way. So fixation. We like to approach specific problems in a specific manner. We have this mental set 
the tendency to approach a particular problem in a particular way. So for example, chess players tend to start a game in a similar manner every time. So you approach usually your homework also in a set order. If you're somebody that loves math, you might start with math right away, or you might actually save it for the end because it might be something easy for you and you can just push through it. And you might be sitting there with AP psychology homework going, oh my goodness, I don't want to go and do anything with terms. I'm going to push that off until the end. You know, you just have your specific set way of doing things. Functional fix fixedness uh, is the tendency to think of things only in terms of their usual functions. So you only see a sock as a sock. You're not ever going to see that sock as something else. Like, for example, a dusting cloth. Once it has a hole in it, you kind of might look at that holy sock and say, you're a garbage sock now. Instead of just, you know, taking the clean sock, putting it on your hand, even though it has a hole, and then going around the house and dusting. You have that ability to do that, but sometimes we don't have that ability. We just get stuck within our boxes. So we have this other thing called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias refers to our tendency to search for information which confirms our current preconceptions or biases. So one disregards all contradictory evidence, no matter what. And a good example, even when the Titanic was filling with water, there were some people that were saying, it's not sinking, it can't sink. This is an unsinkable ship. And other people were like, get me on a lifeboat. I need to get on a lifeboat. We need to get off this thing. It's going down. So underneath confirmation bias, we have natural tendency. If I'm right, then fact C will confirm my theory. I must look for fact C. If I can find fact C, I will be right. Tycho Brahe kept looking for fact C. He never found fact C. Scientific practice. If I'm right, then fact D will disprove or at least disconfirm my theory. I must search for fact D. That's the scientific practice of looking for that. So let's have some fun and think a little bit. So if you want to, you can try doing that drawing a house without lifting your pencil or pen. Um, some of you may have done it in elementary school and now you're trying to figure out how to do it again. Um, or if you really want to, you can go onto YouTube and figure out how to do it. Um, or this challenge where you connect all nine dots with four lines without lifting your pen or pencil. Can you connect all of them maybe with three lines? Are there other tough brain challenges that you have done in your life? I bet there have been. So of course, here is the solution. And the big thing is you have to think outside the box to be able to do it. If you try to keep doing your lines within the box, you're never gonna find the solution. You have to go beyond the borders so that you can find success. So we have this other thing called availability heuristics. Don't judge a book by its cover. Slogans for life that you have been hearing. So with this availability heuristic, images can distort our thinking. When we estimate the likelihood of an event based on how much it stands out in our mind, that is how much it's available as a mental reference. For example, language and images on lottery tickets make us think that we have a higher chance of winning. Mega millions. I mean, look at that. We can win a lot. Millions and millions of dollars. And there's dollar signs. Oh, I want that. I can do that. So we have that. So intuition, looking at intuition. So with intuition, making quick judgments and decisions. As with problem solving, there are mental habits which make intuition style judgments simpler and quicker, but may lead to errors. We have what we just covered, the availability heuristic. We might just simply be overconfident when jumping into something. We might have belief, perseverance, where, yeah, we're just going to keep persevering with our belief. And we also have framing, which you're going to be talking about here in a minute. All of these habits enable us to quickly make hundreds of small gut decisions each day without bothering with systematic reasoning that we might not have time for. So part of our intuition, we have seen 
that a complex situation, it helps us to, you know, use careful reasoning to avoid mistakes. Researchers have stated that sometimes we need to let our unconscious mind do some work. Incubation refers to the power of taking a break from careful thinking, even to maybe sleep on it, to allow leaps in cognition. We might spend hours and hours and hours on something and we're never going to get our breakthrough because our mind is just continually focus on that path that we're not allowed to just let our mind freely think freely wander like it does hey in those you know minutes before you go and fall asleep where boom you might start to have something or the next day when you actually wake up and you have more energy and a different way to view everything so overconfidence, that's when our confidence is obviously greater than our accuracy. You know, I have a two-year-old. The two-year-old believes he can jump a lot farther than what he can actually jump. Teenagers that drive fast are overconfident in their ability to, one, handle a car and in various situations on various types of road, and they also are probably overconfident for the fact that they're not going to get caught. And even that other one, even if they do get caught, that they're not going to get a ticket because somehow they're just going to get out of it. Overconfidence gives us hope and happiness as we believe everything is going to be fine or we simply ignore how it might not be fine. Framing. Framing is how the issue or problem is presented. For example, how it is specifically worded. This can influence our decisions and judgment. How has the term fake news changed people's viewpoint of the reliability of certain news networks within the last year in the United States? Just two words placed in front of something can make somebody have a different thought about the information that they are hearing. So thinking, thinking, we have two different ways of doing that. We have conversion thinking, a thought process where the problem only has one answer and all lines of thinking will eventually lead to that answer by using logic. Divergent thinking, a person starts at one point and produces different ideas of possibilities based on that initial point. So for example, what is a paperclip used for? Can you think of various things? Well, if it's proposed that way, you're probably going to be conver uh, convergent thinking and saying it's going to help keep papers together, right? Well, divergent thinking, if we ask you how many ways can you think of for using a paperclip, now you might think of a whole bunch of different ways to use a paperclip. Or going back to that sock analogy, you might finally go, hey, I can use it as a dust rag. Look at that. So we have different ways to approach our thinking. And again, how you frame the question can also frame our way of thinking. So this was our short lecture on cognition. Our next lecture coming up is going to be on language. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Bye-bye.